Thanks very much, Count Corla. And can I uh, salute the efforts of Deputy Connolly for pushing this issue so strongly and with such determination? Because I think it's quite incredible in some ways that you're the third minister of education. That we've had to highlight the shortcomings in Karanua and the fact that the scheme as it presently operates is actually re-traumatising people. And we have to put a stop to this tonight. When we raise issues and concerns in here, there should be corrective action as a result. And I find it a little bit shocking that when we discussed this in March, when my bill was before the House, everybody on every side, including yourself, Minister, agreed that there were problems with the operation of the scheme and that the message had to go out loud and clear that this needed to be corrected. What happened after that? It was after that that the CEO of Karanua went on the airwaves and caused such trauma and offence to people, lacking empathy and actually displaying incredibly negative attitudes to survivors. And I reject the point, really, in some ways made by, by other deputies that the point was corrected afterwards. Not really. It wasn't really retracted, to be honest. And the views have demonstrated a continued entrenchment of the poor attitudes that other deputies have articulated so well. And I'm quite sure that Rona in my office, who deals with a lot of these cases, would have great sympathy for the case outlined by Michael Healy Ray, because those type of stories are ones that she deals with on a regular basis. Long delays, being denied access, the issues of the offices, and so on and so forth. And so bad is the operation of this scheme that we had the reports in the media this week of Michael Gorry, who's actually said that he is going to take out a loan to repay the money he got from Karanua because he's so traumatised by the treatment he received and the public comments of the CEO. Now, William phoned my office this morning. Uh, he's very down. His entire life has been adversely affected by the abuse he's suffered. He has trust issues. And he says his quality of life is so poor that he wonders how, why he's still alive. Imagine picking up the phone and saying that to some stranger in an office that you've never met before. But he finished the phone call and took the opportunity to write down his story and asked me to uh, inform you uh, about it here tonight, Minister. And he sent in an email after the chat this morning. And he said, I'm a 51-year-old gay man visually impaired. As a child in Mount Carmel Industrial School, Moat County, Westmead, I suffered horrendous abuse, verbally, physical, sexually and emotionally. The institution and the state failed me in not receiving love, care, nurture and education. I wasn't equipped with the tools for the outside world. As an adult on a blind pension, I'm restricted in having any type of a life. On leaving care, I've been through hell. Carrying the horrendous abuse of my childhood, I've been plagued by the memories of what happened to me as a child, the humiliation of failures and lost opportunities in adulthood. I haven't been able to live up to my full potential to form or maintain friendships or relationships. This has caused me huge sadness and embarrassment. On leave and care, I should have been able to enjoy happiness, good health, lots of friends, safe in the knowledge that there was a good path ahead of me, love, care, a good job, a partner, maybe a marriage, but this was sadly not to be. I've been treated harshly, abruptly by Karen Nua, and the remarks of its CEO, Mary Higgins, have devastated and hurt me emotionally and caused me huge pain. Minister, William says, at this moment and for quite some time, my life is lonely, miserable, restricted, fearful and painful. I seem to carry and wear all my life sufferings, not being able to move forward. It seems the state lives my life and not me. The last while I really wonder is it best that I didn't exist at all. I wish I never had to describe myself or my life like this. Minister, maybe you could consider meeting me and allowing me to express how broken I am and how empty my life is. William Gorry, survivor. Now, we've had so many stories like that, so many people ringing the office in tears, talking about their abuse, what happened to them when they contacted Karanua, comments like, couldn't you have got a cheaper Hoover? You, you could build a mansion for that price. This isn't a sweet shop, you know. We've had the stories of people being physically questioned in department stores as to what institution they were in. 
This was supposed to be a process that was a straightforward way of helping people who were hurt by our state and church. Supposed to be part of an acknowledgement and an apology for what was inflicted on them. And let's remember here, every time these people fill in a form, speak to a stranger on the phone, send letters or emails, they have to relive and remember the abuse, the violence, the fear, their own lack of power, the lack of protection and how badly let down they felt. They actually have no obligation to explain themselves to anybody and we shouldn't be putting them in that position. Now, there are a couple of specific issues that I want to raise. I think the problems in a lot of cases are caused by the decision to limit face-to-face meetings. Now, I know the government's amendment have addressed this a bit but it's not enough as far as I'm concerned. The main method of communication via phone and email is hugely problematic. It's very impersonal. It's keeping survivors at arm length, uh, long periods of time where there's no communication at all. And if you're not meeting somebody, it's hard to know from the body language or really get to know them and help them properly. There is a better way of doing things. And I would actually argue that at least 70% of Karen Lewis staff application advisors should be deployed on a face-to-face appointment basis four days a week, seeing about on average four clients a day. The fifth day of the week then when they're working could be a follow-up on paperwork. The face-to-face visit could be in a a home visit or an appointment to an outreach surgery if the person was vulnerable. If 10 advisors of Karanur were deployed in this way, that would be 40 people a day. 160 a week receiving proper face-to-face support. In 10 weeks they could see 1,600 survivors would have had an application to resolve their issues by a serious level of contact on a level that the person could appreciate. I think this would go a long way to break down communication barriers that are actually hindering uh, the interactions with survivors and would in, in that way actually assist in the reconciliation process. It would enable swift and clear responses and expectations explanations being given directly uh, to the survivors. It would be an important point of contact where they could get advice and support on other uh, services specific to their needs. It would enable it to act as a gateway to other uh, mainstream services. It could allow families and other uh, representatives of survivors to accompany them to the appointment to help in the explanation and uh, uh, de-stress some of of the uh, experience and it would certainly help to enable Karen Lewis staff develop an awareness and understanding of what some of these people have gone through and in that sense I think face to face is a key part of this motion and it would compensate for the imbalance of power that survivors often experience when they communicate with professionals or what we call professionals but who in reality in the real meaning of the sense haven't been professional at all. Um, I want to raise specifically problems with two groups of people who've raised particular concerns about the quality of information being provided by Karen Nua. And the first is the deaf community. Obviously, people in the Irish Deaf Society feel that they are at a disadvantage in this process. The clinic held by Karanua at the Deaf Village is only held once a month, which is based in Dublin, and it's held on a weekday during working hours which obviously limits the ability of people to interact. It's inadequate in terms of its frequency. They can't pick up the phone and and, and talk to somebody uh, and get the info afterwards. They need that face-to-face. So that imbalance should have been addressed before now. Now, the Irish Deaf Society first made contact with Karen Nua in 2012. 2012 stressed the importance of making ISL translation available. It's taken the best part, the whole length of this scheme, four years nearly, for them to put the videos online so people can get the information. That's four years that people have, in essence, missed out on a chance to get involved. And the second area is the one raised by other uh, deputies where people are at a significant disadvantage, uh, the group of survivors in the UK. And I have to say it's worrying that less than 20% of applicants so far are from the UK when we know that over 32% of applications to the redress board were based in the UK. This is definitely a concern. So, in conclusion, Cahirlock, the scheme is three and a half years old. And you know what? 
There are people who applied in January 2014 who have received no payment. That is utterly shocking. And yes, we ha- yet we have a staffing bill that has risen to 1.5 million euros per year, 2 million being spent on agency staff. God only knows what's going on with the offices, consultants' bills for capita and mazars of over 180,000 and so on. This is happening while survivors are struggling. Minister, the review is long past its date. It needs to be carried out with absolute urgency and a strong message needs to be sent on this issue. It's gone on far too long. Thank you very much.